The uh, study for tonight is taken from the last two verses of the book of James. That would be James 5, verses 19 and 20. I don't know that I've ever heard, ever heard a lesson simply based on these two verses. I've never preached a lesson on it before either. But I spent some time this past week uh, studying these two verses, and I thought I uh, needed. And what I want to do is to exegete, that's a big word, the verse. In other words, to study the verses themselves on what is contained in there and what, what they teach. I know there's a place for all varieties of sermons. There's a, a place for exhortation in sermons. And uh, there's a place for uh, subject sermons where you go all over the scriptures and, to pick out verses on a certain subject. But sometimes I think the most valuable study we can do is to look into a passage of scripture and just study what's in there to help us understand the Bible better. And that's the case of that tonight of the kind of lesson I want to present. In James chapter 5, verses 19 and 20 says, Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. Now, as I first look at it, it may sound a little difficult. Or on the other hand, you may think this is so simple it really doesn't need explaining. Well, I think it does. James is addressing Christians who sin. Now, we don't claim to be perfect. We do claim, however, that, and or we do understand, however, that the chief thrust of the plan of salvation, of the salvation of God itself, is a battle against sin. We've got to win a battle against sin in order to save our souls. And that's what it's about. It's a fight against sin. Now, this does not merely concern occasional sins of weakness, ignorance, and inadvertence, which Christians from time to time may be guilty of. But this passage, I'm talking about this passage. This passage concerns soul-threatening sin, such as rebellion, presumption, and habitual practice of sin. It is crucial that action be taken to stop one from destroying his soul. Here are four facts taught by this text, and that'll be the basis of this lesson, these four points. The first one of these is the fact that a Christian can err from the truth. That's E-R-R. -R. Some call it err. Maybe that's a better pronunciation. I don't know. A Error is like A-I-R, but that's not, not the word here. The word is E-R-R, -R, to err from the truth. Notice err from the truth, a variation from a departure from the truth. Now, it is obedience to the truth that purifies us from sin to begin with, purifies the soul. The truth is the medium through which the soul is purified. Error and that is a variation of the word err, E-R-R, E-R-R-O-R, -R -R is the noun. The verb is E-R-R. -R. Uh, an error has no power to save. It will not deliver anybody from his sins and the guilt of his sins and the consequences of his sins. Truth will. In 1 Peter 1.22 Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. Now the first part of that said, ye purified your souls in obeying the truth. That sells us heaps right there. It tells us we have got to do something. Anytime a person asks the question in the, in the New Testament, what must I do to be saved? He was always given something to do. He was never told, well, you just don't have to do anything. Just let yourself be passive and, and receive Jesus. That's not the language of the scriptures. That's the language of false religion. Even though there is a truth to the fact that we must receive Jesus Christ in order to be saved. 
But the sinner is always given something to do. And it was a matter of obeying the commands of the gospel, of obeying the truth. Now, severed from the truth, a person has put his soul in extreme danger of eternal punishment. And that's what he's speaking of here when he speaks of erring or erring from the truth. That is, of being severed from it. And as we said, he puts his soul in mortal danger. This is not just committing a sin. Because in 1 John 1 and verse 8 says... If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. John is writing to Christians. He's writing to faithful Christians. But these are not, this is not the type of sin necessarily in a way that he's talking about here in this passage. But there is a, one can so sin so as to depart from the truth. A sin of rebellion a sin of presumption, and presumption in the Bible talks about that, and the Old Testament talks about the presumptuous sin, or just simply getting in the habit of a sin or sins and practicing sin once again. In Galatians 3 and verse 1, and using a later version here, Paul writes, Who hath bewitched you that you should stop obeying the gospel? Now that is permissible there. The King James says that you should obey not the gospel or not obey the gospel. But it's in the present tense in the original language in in indicating an habitual practice, a continuance, if you would, of not obeying the truth. Who hath bewitched you that you should stop obeying the truth? Now this passage of our text here proves that apostasy is possible. One of the tenets of the doctrine of Calvinism is that once a person is saved, there is no way that he can so sin as to be lost. It's called the impossibility of apostasy. And it's also called once in grace, always in grace. And the Calvinistic theory goes something like this. Since God is totally responsible for your salvation, and he is because he chose you individually from the foundation of the world to be one of the saved, Now, once he indicates to you that you're one of the saved by sending upon you saving faith, and they say that that faith is a gift of God, that sometime during your life, the Lord is going to indicate to you that you're one of the elect. And so he will send his saving faith upon you. Well, once he sends his saving faith upon you, then you can't lose it. Otherwise, this would be a reflection against God. He made a wrong choice, you see. Well, God can't do that because he's all-knowing. And so they come up with the doctrine that you just can't fall from grace once God bestows his grace on you. Well, all of this, in fact, the, 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 the basic premise upon which this is based is flatly false. The idea that God chooses individuals from the foundation of the world to be saved, and then the rest of them are chosen by his same predestination to be lost. And anything they can do to be saved. Well, you know this is not the truth. One reason it goes against the whole tenor of the scripture. First of all, in inviting people to make a choice to accept Jesus. And the other, that they can make a choice to choose to do wrong. And end up finally saved anyway. And this, this is not the God of the Bible. This is a God of Calvinism, an invention from the fertile imaginations of some men. And he didn't do it by himself. He had some help even in the centuries previous to him going clear back to Augustine and then he went back to the the Gnostics to come up with such an idea as this. But it's not the biblical idea. This passage proves, here's my point. This passage here proves that once one is saved, he can again so sin as to be finally lost. If that were not the case, why are there so many warnings against apostasy? That is a falling away from the faith and being lost. In Galatians 5 and verse 4, Whosoever of you have justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. Our study this morning in the Bible class was in Romans chapter 4 where he points out in 5 that The law of Moses doesn't save. It was abolished. 
We are not under that law today. Those who would attempt to go back under that law are going into an old system that has no salvation. That's why he says if you're once saved, that is, you accepted Christ, and then go back to the old law to keeping it again. And this is also the warning in Hebrews, the passage you read in your hearing there in Hebrews 6. That you're fallen from the grace of God and therefore you will be lost in the end if you remain in that state. In 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 12, he said, Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Don't get overconfident in your faith because if you don't take heed and remain faithful to Christ, then you'll fall from the grace of God. And the last end will be worse than the beginning. This is 2 Peter 2 and verse 20. Where there he describes uh, apostasy as being similar to a dog that turns to his own vomit again and to a sow that was washed who are wallowing in the mire. But before that he says the worst end, the, the last end is worse for them than the beginning. Well, their beginning was they were alien sinners. They didn't know the gospel. They were lost because of their sins. And then they learned the gospel, obeyed it, and, and was saved. And then they left the faith. That was their last end. The last end was worse than before they ever heard the gospel. They were lost both times. But the reason it's worse is because now they knew better. And perhaps beforehand they didn't know. They didn't know the gospel. Then there's a passage that was read in your hearing. Let's look at it again. Hebrews 6 and verse 6. In verse 6, for it is impossible for those who are once enlightened. Now, as we go through this, follow it carefully. Notice there are five things that he mentions which describes a fully saved person. Now, the reason I bring this up is because those that say a man cannot fall from grace, they say, well, if he does, he wasn't saved in the first place. People, that's not so. Listen to this. This is a description of a saved person. Those who are once enlightened... They were enlightened by the gospel and tasted the heavenly gift. They were actually experienced salvation in Christ and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost. If they weren't saved, they wouldn't have been partakers of the Holy Ghost. Of course they were saved and have tasted the good word of God, that is by obedience to it, and the powers of the world to come. That is, they tasted the powers of the world to come. That if they experience salvation in Christ. Now, if they shall fall away. Now, if they couldn't fall away, why in the world say that? If they shall fall away. Of course it's possible. If they shall fall away to renew them again into repentance. Seeing they have crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him into an open shame. One other misconception here. He isn't saying they can't be forgiven. fact is they won't be if they continue in this state. But he isn't saying they can't be forgiven. He's just saying that if they reject Christ as, the, as their sacrifice, there's nothing else to look forward to. There's no other sacrifice. There's no other way. There's no other dispensation. There's no other plan of salvation. This is the final. And it's the perfect one. And, the only, and since it's perfect, you can't improve on it. You can't have a dispensation following the Christian dispensation because the Christian dispensation of Jesus Christ's sacrifice is perfect. And if you add something to a perfect thing, you make it imperfect once again. So that's all it's saying here. Now it might be that the person, if, if he in his mind has made a final resolution of his life that he's not going to have Jesus Christ, that he rejects him, turns his back on him, he will be lost. It's not because God can't forgive him. It's because he has forfeited the forgiveness of God by his stubborn plunge on the slippery downward slope of unbelief. Now, the standard which determines whether one has erred or not is the truth. I got all this from this one phrase here. If any man err from the truth, it's the criterion it is the standard. It is the word of God. Jesus said in his prayer, sanctify them through thy word, thy word. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word 
is truth. In a word, it's the Bible. I said this morning, I'll say it again, and I say it about every Sunday, the Bible is the very word of God. It's God's word communicating to us his nature and his will for us. Our response to the word of God is the measure of our faith. Now, the goal of the Christian is to sin not. Look at 1 John 2 and verse 1. My little children, these things I write unto you that ye sin not. We could stop right there and we got the lesson. That's the goal. That's what we're trying for. Not to rebel against God. Not to be presumptuous and run ahead of him. Not to fall back into the habitual practice of sin or a sin, but to sin not. Now, he does add to that, and I'm sure thankfully he did. Yet if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Another fact that we gain from this passage here in James chapter 5, one who errs can be converted. Convert means to change. Now, more often we use the term convert to talk about the change that takes place from an alien sinner to becoming a child of God. And that is conversion. That's a change. In fact, this is Acts 3.19. Repent you therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. But for the erring Christian, it also takes a conversion. It takes a change in order for him to be restored or replaced back into the state of salvation, which he was. Now, when one obeys the gospel of Christ initially, he's converted from the state of being lost into the state of being saved, from outside of Christ to inside of Christ. And I think I've heard Brother Jimmy Young say this, he is no longer classified as a sinner. He is a saint. The word saint and sinner stand at opposites. One cannot be both. He's one or the other. Now that's defining the term sinner as one who habitually sins, one who practices sin. And I've heard uh, some of my teaching brethren say it to their their error that uh, oh we're all sinners the only difference is I'm a saved sinner and you're a lost sinner uh, that's kind of messing up your terms a little bit Lord never considered a saint as a sinner and we ought to all be saints by saint you understand I mean one set apart for the purposes of God he no longer practices sin the blood of Christ has forgiven his sins and they keep his sins forgiven as long as he walks in the light But as we said, one can so sin as to be lost. He can err from the truth. And he needs converting. He needs to change from his apostate position back to the saved state, being restored back to the original. He go, needs to go back where he came from. When he departed from the faith, going back to the faith. The problem with the, with the, with the brethren they describe in Hebrews, instead of returning back the way they came from, they're seeking another route. And there's not one to be had. When one departs from the faith, he needs to return to the faith. In Galatians 6 and verse 1 says, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also should be tempted. David said, Restore unto me the joy of my salvation. Psalm 51 and verse 12. All right, here is... The main thrust of the, of the verse seems to be that not so much the one who has departed as the one who is trying to help him back. So Christians have a responsibility toward the brethren to preserve and to rescue. First of all, to exhort the brethren, don't depart. And second of all, if they do depart, to try to rescue them from the direction they're going and where they're going to end up at. And people, this is a good work. Sometimes we talk about, it, we, we cast about think, well, what can I do for the Lord? What kind of works do I do? Sometimes we come up with very little because we don't realize what all we do that is a work for the Lord. One of them is to 
Help our brother. Help him get to heaven. Exhort and encourage them to stay in the faith. And if they happen to stumble and fall, to try to get them to pick themselves back up and to go on from there. People, listen, we cannot be content just to let a brother go. We have to try. Now, I know we can't make them come back by force, but we have to try. We can't just let them go. The third fact that we gain from this is the one who converts him, and that's his connector with the second. The one who converts him saves a soul from death. Now, the soul that's saved from death is not the faithful brother that's trying to bring him back. Now, the Lord may hold us responsible for trying, and if we don't try, we could be in trouble with the Lord. But that's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about the one who's rescued. The one who has erred is again, as we said, and, and this is point, I should have made that point here. Because the one who has erred is again classified as a sinner. Look at it here. Let him know that he which converteth the sinner. Now he was a brother. Now he's a sinner. Again, from the error of his way. He's no longer a saint because he's not set apart from sin anymore. He's gone back into it. Now he is on his way to death. And he's not just talking about physical death here. He's talking about spiritual death. He's talking about eternal death. The kind of death Ezekiel the prophet talked about in Ezekiel 18 and verse 4 when he said, The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Now we realize that we're all going to die physically. So Ezekiel's not talking about that. He's talking about that which is a consequence of sin. Now if you, leave, if you put that in his context in Ezekiel 18... He's talking about personal responsibility. The one that does the sinning is the one that's going to do the dying. The father shall not die for the son or the son for the father for their sins. But it also teaches a lesson of the consequence of sin. That is spiritual death. Now the soul that sinneth is in serious trouble. The soul that is saved then is the erring brother, the one who is converted and comes back. But his saving does indeed depend on his changing. If it doesn't change, continues on the same road he's traveling, he'll be finally lost. So it is conditional. Salvation is conditional in more than one way. The Lord has given us a choice. We have this choice up until the day we die. I guess it's possible you could point an exception to that one who becomes totally mentally incompetent to make a decision. But we're talking about a normal person. And it's a death only that the last choice has been made. There's no further choice to be made after death. But up until that time, a person can still make a choice to come back if he can and will. Number four, fact. It says he hides a multitude of sins. Let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. Again, those multitude of sins that are hidden are the sins of the erring one. If I'm the rescuer and I have a multitude of sins, Rescuing that erring brother is not going to hide my sins. I'm going to have to repent of my own sins. <laughs> if my sins are going to be hidden. He's talking about the one that's that's uh, erring brother that is rescued here. The one that uh, notice and, and the, the notice the language here, the, the grammar that brings that out. He that converteth shall save and hide the two things both are the consequence of the verb he that converteth by hiding it doesn't mean that the one who the rescuer deceives and conceals erring one's guilt and deeds It means he is instrumental in getting him to change 
to bring him to repentance and obedience to the Lord's and can I use a term that my brethren have been using for years, although I cannot quote book, chapter, and verse for The second law of pardon. And I'll more fully describe that directly. One cannot hide his sins from the Lord by deception. He shouldn't even try. In Hebrews 4 and 13, it says, Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, for all things are naked and opened unto the him with whom we have to do. And that's the Lord. So we shouldn't even try. So that's not the point here. That's not the kind of covering he's talking about. And the Lord himself does not simply ignore sin. His holiness doesn't allow him to do it, to, to just overlook it. It has to be done in a spiritual Yes, even a legal way in God's law. <laughs> Talking about his, his laws. God provides the covering for our sins. I think you probably studied this probably last Sunday. But in Romans 4, verses 7 and 8, it says, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Now, the imputing there means put to the account of. Even the person hadn't earned it for his account, he still, it's imputed to his account. The Lord imputes it to his account. Here's the point. Sin demands the life of the sinner. He's got to forfeit his life. If you forfeit your life for sin, then uh, there's nothing left of you to go to heaven. You'll end up in the fires of hell. That's the cost of sin. That's the wages of sin. Jesus came to this earth to pay that penalty on our behalf. He died for our sins. He shed his blood. Now, the blood represents the life principle in the person. When the blood is shed, it means he gave his life. So the blood representing the life, the blood, Jesus' life was given for our life, and it frees our life to live. Now, it doesn't condemn his life either, except in a vicarious way because he didn't do any sins. He didn't die for his own sins. He died for our sins. The Lord, one of the beautiful things about the Lord's way is he allowed substitution. Jesus Christ's life substituted for ours. All right, the blood represents the life. So the blood covers the sin. And when the Lord looks upon us, he doesn't see our sin. He sees the blood of Christ and his holiness remains intact. If we have been redeemed by the blood of Christ, if we've obeyed the gospel, in other words, and are living faithful. This is not unlike the uh, Passover in Egypt back in the long ago. When the blood of a lamb was sprinkled on the doorpost and the little post, the messenger of death came by. He saw that blood and he did not go in to bring about death of the firstborn in that house. When our holy and righteous heavenly father sees the blood of Christ covering our sins, that's all he sees. He doesn't see our sin and therefore we live. We have spiritual life and we entertain the hope of heaven. Now, this matter of multitude of sins he talks about here, I'm not real sure exactly what all he means by it covers the multitude of sins. One thing I am sure of, that there's not a sin left out that the blood of Christ doesn't cover. Another observation might be this, that whenever one goes into sin, goes back into sin, deliberate sin I'm talking about, generally it's not just one sin. Because there has to be other sins to prop up the first sin. And so it doesn't just amount to one sin, but that it usually involves a multitude of sin. But there's no sin that the Lord cannot or will not forgive if the person can and will repent. And that's the good news for us. And that's the one I want to leave. This, this, the, both these verses here put together. They imply that there is hope for a brother who errs from the truth. He doesn't have to stay that way. He can come back. 
And sometimes he needs the help of the faithful brethren to do so. And that's what he's encouraging. Sometimes the question occurs, am I my brother's keeper? You know, that passage comes from the Old Testament, Genesis chapter 4 and verse 7, where this is a reply that Cain made to the Lord after he'd killed his brother Abel. And uh, you can almost see there was kind of a, I don't know what you call it, kind of a sneering answer to the Lord here when he says, when the Lord says, where is thy brother? Well, it doesn't wasn't a matter of a geographical location as much as it was, what is the state of thy brother? And Cain knew, because he'd killed him. I don't know where he, where he left the body, but it was there somewhere. And the Lord knew too. So he says, where is thy brother? And Cain says, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And so many of my brethren will readily answer, yes, we are. Well, I'm not so sure it's that simple of an answer. Now, we will be concerned about our brother's spiritual well-being. And we will try to help him get to heaven. In that sense, I guess the answer is yes. But we cannot coerce him into doing right. Nor will we be punished if our attempts to assist him to get to heaven are spurned. If he's finally lost after we have tried, then we will not have to answer for that. That's my point, I guess, in answering the question in my, my brother's keeper. We are in a certain sense. But in another sense, we are not. Because he is ultimately responsible for his own soul just like I am ultimately responsible for my own soul. In Ephesians chapter uh, 6 and verse 5, for every man shall bear his own burden. That is, the burden of my soul salvation is ultimately mine. And I will be judged on that individual basis. In Romans 14, 10 and 12 says, for we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. So then every one of us should give an account of himself to God. If you study that in its context, he's talking about judging your brother. And how we need to be careful that we do not unduly judge our brother. Because, he says, we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Not before the judgment seat of our brother. But the judgment seat of Christ. And then he says, every one of us should give an account of himself, not to my brother but to God. Now that's my ultimate disposition of life and eternity. But this doesn't take away from what he's saying here is that sometimes we need to help our brother get to heaven. An erring Christians being converted does not involve baptism. Sometimes I think this is misunderstood. A person thinks, well, if I was converted the first time through baptism, involving baptism, then that's, I need to be baptized again. If a person was baptized from the heart. Obedi if it was an obedience from the heart the first time. It's only a one-time event. Christ only died once, was buried once, arose again from the dead one time. Our baptism is an imitation of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Therefore, it's only a one-time thing. And as I were to repeat myself, then later on in the chapter, that's, that's Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4, he says, uh, you've obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine. That was the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And the obedience was in the waters of baptism. Then baptism then is a one-time event, just like Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection is a one-time event. Now, a Christian who stumbles and falls away may come back. Boy, that's saying a heap right there. What if the Lord wouldn't let us come back? What if he says, I'll give you one chance. And if you don't get it right, you're out of here. But instead he pleads with us. Not only gives us the opportunity, he pleads with us. He has erring children to come back to him. And in a way, he never gives up on us. I think he does recognize that sometimes a person has totally given up on him. But we may come back, and that's a great privilege of God. And the Lord will receive us. He's promised that he would. 
What it takes is this. It takes an acknowledgement of our sin. As long as a person denies that he's really in sin again and lost again, he's not going to have much incentive to do anything about it. I think that's one of our problems. One of the labors of gospel preachers is try to convince people that they're lost. So they will do something about it. In 1 John 1 and verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What does that confession of sin involve? Well, I think it is a generic term which involves more than just saying. I think it also involves, in fact, we have an example of it. You don't have to say, I think. Let's go to Acts chapter 8. Where the sinner was told, repent, this is Acts 8, 22. Repent, therefore, of this thy wickedness. And pray, God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart might be forgiven thee. Surely you can see the necessity of repentance here because, as we said, the living the Christian life is a battle against sin. Being saved is a battle against sin. And then we have the privilege of prayer. You know, the, this Father's Day, I didn't even mention this. I, I guess some of my fellow preachers had Father's Day sermons. I didn't. But uh, children have the privilege of making requests of their father. His own children. Now, other people's children don't really have that same right to make requests of him. God's children have a right to make requests of him. And in this case, the request is, forgive me. Because we are children of God. Children of the devil don't have a right to ask God to forgive them. That's not a privilege. Of course, their father, he don't have the power to forgive. He wouldn't anyway. He don't want him to. But we have the right to pray. And that's one reason why we invite folks who are members of the Church of Christ who have so sinned that they've stumbled and fallen down to get back up again. And if it is an offense that needs to be brought before the brethren to come forward at the conclusion of a lesson and request the prayers of the brethren, and their coming forward indicates their acknowledgement of their sin and that they have repented of it. And we assume and accept that. And then we do pray with them for forgiveness. Sometimes it's a private thing between you and your God or maybe one other person. You want to go to them and say, look, I'm wrong. I've changed and I want to be forgiven. Well, God forgive me. But if it's a sin that's known to the congregation, then the expedient thing to do is to acknowledge it before the congregation and prayer be made. Above all, if you have erred from the truth, don't continue in that way. Have the courage to quit your sin and then have the courage to come back again. 